but we're all the same. We may have come in different packages, but we're the same. Nobody's any better than anybody else because all of us are sinners who needed to be saved by the grace of God. What we have in common? Jesus. What else do we have in common? Heaven. And we're going to make sure that Jesus is our Lord and heaven is our destiny. Anything in between does not really count. We're on our way to somewhere. And I'm taking you on this little journey in these weeks and a couple of weeks to come. The road to Pentecost. My, what a promise that Jesus has given to his disciples. Turn with me to the scripture text in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, the NIV version. I'll be reading from that uh, translation. In my former book, Theophilus, now you may ask, well, who is Theophilus? That's what I ask. Well, Theophilus in the Greek is lover of God or friend of God. He was known as a Jewish believer from Alexander. And there are other thoughts concerning who Theophilus was, that he was or a person that they bestowed honor upon. But regardless of who Theophilus was, he was a friend of Luke. He says, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit. Now, mark that. Given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his sufferings, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he indeed was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. A command is different than a request. Hello. A command is something that you are to do. He says to them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John truly baptized, John baptized you with water. And this baptism was in significance of Christ, of the Jewish people. The Bible says he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. And that made a doorway for those who received him who were not Jews. And it was a need and a necessary empowerment for the disciples to be filled with the Spirit of God, to be filled with the evidence and proof that they had been with Jesus. For they were to go and open a door and an avenue for us for those who were not God's chosen people. Jesus had proven to the disciples and the disciples to come that he is very much alive. He knew that some people would be skeptical about whether he really was alive, as many of us would be skeptical about something that we have seen, that something that we've witnessed, and we've seen the end of it. But Jesus wanted them to have no doubts. He removed all the doubts with infallible proofs that he was the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus knew that they desired in their hearts to be like him. Hello. We desire as believers to be like Jesus. We want people to know without a shadow of a doubt that we have been 
with Jesus and that we are in the presence of Jesus. And God was going to bestow upon those individuals living proof. Jesus knew that they desired to be with him and to want to be around him. The only way that they could be like him was to be of the same spirit and mind to function as he would. The only way that we are going to be like Jesus is having his spirit and his mind. It is the only way that we could represent him. Application number one, obedience to Christ's demand is not optional. Well, we can't take it or leave. Well, we can. We can leave it. But it's best that we do it. In the written word, there are three things required to receive the blessings of God. Jot these down. Obedience, faith, and trust are fundamental in being a Christ follower. And you can't afford to leave one of those out. Needless to say, there are believers today that do not receive God's full blessings. Why is that? Well, they've chosen shortcuts. They've chosen not to follow his instructions. There are no shortcuts to being in the center of God's will, but simply to obey and have faith and trust him. We all are going to be tested in those areas of life as believers. There are options. There are options that we conceive in our minds that, well, maybe I really don't have to do all of that or or, or really, maybe the Lord is, is saying, you know, this or, or that. No, he is saying what he is saying. And you may have to wrestle with it within your heart. You may have to struggle with it within your heart because you are having difficulty receiving what the Lord has asked of you. Have you noticed in life that sometimes to go forward requires us to go backwards? And you know what I'm, I, I'm realizing? The older I get, the more I have to go backwards. <laughs> Where are my keys? Where are my glasses? It's kind of ironic, but it's true. In order for us to go forward, sometimes we have to go back to the day of our conversion. And we have to recall that, and we have to remember that. And we have to remember what that feel, felt like when the burden of sin was lifted from our hearts and we felt cleansed and we felt free and we felt the liberty and mercy of God I never, ever want to lose that feeling. I want to be grateful with what God has done for me because I know what he's done. There is nothing that I could have done to be worthy of it. Jesus sent them back to Jerusalem, the very place where their hopes had been dashed because they didn't really understand why Jesus had to die the way, he was, the, the way he did. They didn't understand it. Jesus tried to help them to understand, but they didn't. John 14, 22, the New King James Version, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. When was the last time you had a manifestation of Jesus? Uh-oh. 
that he manifested himself in a certain way, in a certain thing that you were dealing with. You heard his voice. You felt the tug of his spirit. When was the last time that occurred? Jesus is all about manifesting himself to his believers. He wants you to know that it's not just a phrase that, lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of time. We need a tug every now and then. It's kind of like, you know, for us married couples, we want to know that, that she's there. We want to know that, that he's there. So we need a touch to know that they are with us. Application number two, waiting is contrary to our nature. Hallelujah. <laughs> we do not like waiting. You know, sometimes I, I must admit, I, I, I must confess, confession is good for the soul, correct? Sometimes my, my, my wife is preparing dinner, and she knows that I like it smoking hot. You know how sometimes it's so hot you have to... And I don't want to wait until it cools. You know, sometimes you invite people over for, for dinner, and the food is, is really hot and warm, and uh, it just seems, though, that, you know, people are taking a long time to come to the table and eat. <laughs> and you want to hurry up and get to the meat of the reason why you've gathered. You think about that we give ourselves time limits when we're going to do something or plan something. We give ourselves time limits. And some of us don't give ourselves very much time. Well, oh, I could do that, you know, in this amount of time. I, oh, I could do that in that amount of time. And then we get to the freeway. And somewhere in that decision-making process, Somebody said, could have been your wife, could have been your husband, we need to go a little bit earlier just in case. Oh, there's plenty of time. And then we get there, and then we get frustrated and angered, and we can affect everybody around us. But this doesn't happen to the believers. Rather odd that the more technological we become as a people, the less we want to wait. Interesting, isn't it? The more advancement, how quick can I get it? How quick can it happen? We just don't want to wait. If you haven't noticed being impatient is a major character flaw and can only be corrected by the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 23, the NIV version, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, <laughs> kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Whenever we find ourselves becoming impatient, it ought to indicate a red flag. And that we need to pray right then and right there. If we don't pray, some way we stray from what God wanted to do in that situation with us to reflect who he was. Application number three. We can't afford to delay his order. Hello. 
Well, I don't have to do it right now. You know, I got it. I heard you. But uh, I've got this priority. I got that priority. We can't afford to delay when God speaks into our lives. There's always a chance of something coming up to derail us. Have you noticed that? When you put something aside, when you delay something, you get sidetracked. That's why, you know, as we exit the, 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 the auditorium and people ask a request, well, would you pray for such and such or this? Right there. Right on the spot. Right there. So my line may get a little clogged up, but I'm praying for people who've made requests, and I pray that you'll have the grace. And as you see me praying for someone, that you will agree with the prayer that I'm praying, even though you may not be able to hear it. But we are to be instant in prayer. Can't allow anything to derail us or put anything off because, you know what happens? We're forgetful people. No, not the saints of God. We're never forgetful. <laughs> We're forgetful people. Somebody will make a request, and we will say, sure, I'll do it. And then the, the week comes by, and then you see them, and you say, oh, Lord. <laughs> now I remember what I had promised. Well, the blessing was in the obedience when the request was made. Take a look at this. Luke 9, 60, uh, 50, 60s, uh, this passage, this particular passage, and I'm pinpointing uh, a particular verse within uh, uh, Luke 9, 61 and 62. But let me give you a little background. Jesus had met several men. And all of these men said, I will follow you. Because they knew that something very unusual about Jesus. He was like none other person that they ever met. He says, I'll follow you. And then Jesus began to say, well, I'm homeless. I have no place to stay. I have no place to put my head. I'm homeless. Well, the brother that wanted to follow began to back out. He didn't bargain for all of that. And then there's another person that came and told Jesus he would follow him. But he says, let me put a stipulation on this. Well, first my, pa my, my dad has passed away. Let me go bury him first, and then I'll follow you. And Jesus says, well, let the dead bury the dead. Did you think that guy followed? No, he didn't follow. And then there was another one that said to Jesus, and I'm reading here uh, from Luke 9, 61, 62. Another said also, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to my family. And Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. So we see in this context that there are people who desire to follow Jesus but aren't willing to make the necessary commitment and sacrifice. We'll look for a reason to do something that we don't want to do. There is a time element attached to Jesus' commands that requires immediate response. My, my grandson, who's, who's 20 now, he's going on 21, he lived with Gloria and I for, for a time. And, and as a lad, you know how we do, parents. As a lad, he, he came to Gloria with a request. And sometimes we say, well, go see your grandfather. 
And then sometimes the grandfather says, go see your grandmother. And so realizing that he made a request and he says to my wife, I don't know what the request was, but he says, yes or no? Yes or no? He didn't want to dilly-dally around with, well, go see your grandfather. Well, let me think about that. Yes or no? And we, we tell him about that, and we all chuckle because he was a young kid, and he wanted a yes or no answer. And I think that's the way the Lord is. He wants a yes or no answer concerning whether or not we will follow him. And um, we could either say yes, or we could either say no. But the urgency of the request requires us to respond. God may be asking you who are sitting here, will you follow me? Will you believe me? Will you trust me? Will you allow me to handle it? Sometimes we have problems and we say, well, I'm committing it to the Lord. 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 The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. If we have committed something to the Lord, take your hands off. Take your hands off. Step away. And allow God to do what only he can do. You see, we're not the parachute. We're not the person that rescues. It's the Holy Spirit that rescues. It's the Holy Spirit that brings people under conviction. It is the Holy Spirit that opens the eyes of, of the intellect, opens the ears of those who are deaf in regards to hearing. You see, because, you know, we could tell somebody so long the same message every time they come to us. And you know what they hear? You, they just tune you out because they've heard that. But they're persistent in what they are asking you to do it, and so they wear you down. We are to wait with expectations. Every promise that the Lord gives us should be received on the basis of the truth. There are promises and commitments that we make to one another, and they go unfulfilled because you fill in the blanks. Why do they go unfulfilled? You fill in the blanks. When Jesus made the declaration that I am the truth, the way, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6, he makes it impossible for him to lie. Whenever the truth gives us a promise, the powers of darkness will not prevail. Hear me now, hear me, hear me. Whenever God gives you a promise, in spite of what is going on with you, in spite of what is happening in you, in spite of what is going on around you, the gates of darkness cannot prevail over the promises of God. He gave you a promise, you hold on to it. Nothing is going to break his promise that he commits to you. Absolutely nothing. He would remove, he would move heaven and earth to fulfill his promise to us because he loves us, because he has purpose in everything that happens in us. Even though we may not be able to discern the purpose or the reason why things happen, they're happening for a reason. And it's usually concerning the kingdom of God. Truth will never deviate from the purpose of the promise made to you. 
he's not going to come up with an excuse. Well, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not good for you, you know. He'll wait until the proper time. We just have to wait. Think about, suppose you were Abraham. Mm. Well, nothing's happening. I know what God promised me, but, but nothing is happening. So maybe I have to come up with some creative idea to make it happen. Yeah, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. We're in this mess because you went outside the will of God and now there's a conflict of nations because of the sin and the promise are in conflict. The son of sin and the son of promise. There is no simple response required from anyone that is only to obey. Obedience should not be based upon how you feel about what was promised. Well, you know, if, if it feels good, well, you know, I can, I can hold on to that. I can, I can see that, you know, I can understand that, I can feel that. But if you don't understand, understand the person that made the promise. If Jesus has given you a promise, Jesus will fulfill that promise in his time. Hello. You need to wait so that your strength can be renewed. Mm. They that wait upon the Lord shall what? Do you need some strength today? Do you need some strength today? Well, begin to wait upon the Lord to worship him, to serve him, to magnify him for who he is. Isaiah 41.10, NIV, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Think about this. Jesus told them, I want you to go back. I want you to go back to Jerusalem. Well, you know, they crucified you. And, and we're believers. He says, go back. Go back to the very place where you all became grieved. Go back to that place. And when you go back, I'm promising you that not too many days, the promise that God has made to you is going to be fulfilled. You're going to receive the Spirit of God. If there was ever a time that we need to be full of the Spirit of God. It's in these days. People need to know the Lord. God has called us to be a reflection of who he is in the earth. We are his witnesses. If we don't do our responsibility, There are going to be lots of lost people. Father, we thank you for the moving of your spirit. Thank you for the promise of your spirit, Lord, that you have poured out for all nations and generations and people to come to know you. Father, we pray that you bless your people. Give us the strength. Give us the encouragement. Lord, we know that there is power in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we speak not with intrepidation, but we speak with the authority that you've given the church of the living God. Father, bless us now. In Jesus' name, we ask it. Amen. Amen.
Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Lord, may your grace rest upon us. May the power of your Holy Spirit fill us. And Lord, may you lead us into a plain path. And may your kingdom increase. In Jesus' name, amen.